Thank you. I'm sure glad no one set the expectations to be very high for this presentation. <laughs> so the last hour has been amazing, simply because my Eigenharp sequence here quit. Uh, I've had more hardware failures. My uh, laptop has kernel panicked twice in the last uh, uh, 12 hours. My uh, entire presentation disappeared. Uh, but I actually found a backup of it that I made last night. So this is going to be very interesting. Now, one of the things that I think has been amazing about PyCon this year is what you see on either end of these giant screens. This transcription stuff is amazing. I can't imagine trying to do this myself. I can't type that fast or nearly that accurately. But I must confess, you know, I'm a biker, and I got a little bit of devil in me. So um, through three cheese trees, three free fleas flew. Well, these three free fleas flew, Freezy Breeze blew. Freezy Breeze made these three cheese trees cheese freeze. Freezy Cheese made these three free fleas sneeze. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get started with this. If I can uh, get out of my... That's what I want to see. That's up there. Or that's what I wanted to see. In the next five minutes, there are going to be a lot of things going on, <laughs> all at the same time. Now, any of them could go wrong. And I will compensate for them if they do go wrong. But what I want you guys to do is pay attention to what catches your eye. What do you look at? What do you see? So let's see. OK. Got your seat belts on? You're going to need them. Let's begin. Please work. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. You know, I will always remember the day that I first learned to ride a motorcycle. It was not because I could have died that day, but it was because I started to read a most extraordinary and life-changing book. This book had been given to me two years earlier, but I was too intimidated to read it. It's 800 dense pages, and it's really tough to get into. So I let it sit on the bookshelf for two years. But you know, it glared at me. <laughs> and uh, one day I decided I needed to start reading it. So I picked it up, started reading, got to about page 50, and I was ready to put it back on the shelf because I was having a tough time. But I persevered. And by the time I got to about page 100, it seemed like only a few moments had passed because the book had reached out and pulled me in. The chapter was about recursion and the underlying connection in all sorts of different things. Language, music, uh, mathematics. Uh, there's an underlying theme in all of these different things. And it really spoke to my worldview. At that point in my life, I was living just outside of Glacier National Park in northwest Montana. I was working for a small computer company that wrote school record software on small IBM machines. This was before the IBM PC, uh, to do school record software for Indian reservations. Well, part of my job was also to teach programming at the community college for the Blackfeet Nation in the town of Browning. It was an interesting job to have. It was just I was fresh out of school. So I was reading this book, and I totally lost track of time. I had to teach that night, and by the time I realized what was going on, I had only 40 minutes to drive the 20 miles to Browning and at the same time come up with a lecture. So I uh, grabbed my, my stuff, I put my backpack on, and at the last minute I took the Gödel Escher Bach book and put it in my backpack, and I walked out to my car. But you know, of course, the car wouldn't start. I knew what was wrong with the car, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to fix it in the amount of time that I had. So I went over to my landlady's house, Gladys, uh, and uh, asked her if she'd give me a ride into Browning. She was quite unenthusiastic. Uh, and uh, she was not interested in letting me borrow her car either. But she did hand me a set of keys and said, here, 
take my son's motorcycle. <laughs> I told her, I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. But her response was, well, I guess you're not teaching tonight, are you? <laughs> uh, and being the responsible person that I am, I realized I'm the teacher. I can't just beg off and not show up. So I took the keys out to the bike, and I started to look at it. And I said, I could do this. It's just like a bicycle. I can ride bicycles. And uh, so I got the bike started. Uh, killed it a couple times trying to get it moving forward, but I did get it moving forward and went down about the one mile dirt road down to the highway where I was supposed to turn left. Well, guess what happened? Within just a few moments, I was sprawled on the asphalt on US Highway 2. What had happened was a problem of complexity. You see, the motorcycle user interface and a bicycle user interface are similar but not the same. At the bottom of the hill, just before the stop sign, I skid, skidded on the uh, gravel. That caused me to panic. I held onto the handle grips tighter, which meant I inadvertently rolled on the throttle, uh, which, of course, the motorcycle immediately caught traction, and I shot onto the highway without so much of a glance in either direction where there would be cross traffic. I then let my bicyclist Re instincts take over. Now, if I had been on a bicycle in this situation, I would have leaned hard to the left, locked up my rear tire, which would have skid the back end of the bike around, I'd be aimed in the right direction, and then I'd pedal hard to start moving forward. I tried to do the same thing on the motorcycle, minus the pedaling, of course. But what happened, you know that lever on a bicycle for the, on the right-hand grip? That's the rear brake. On a motorcycle, that's the front brake. I locked up the front tire, and the bike flipped over. Fortunately, it did not land on top of me, but I was sp spread on the asphalt, stunned. My glasses had flown off. Uh, and you know, I was lying there. I remember this so distinctly. I was looking at the asphalt and looking at all those little cracks and thinking about the book that I'd been reading and underlying connections of things. And you know those little valleys and mountains in the asphalt? They were just like these this beautiful valley I was in in Glacier National Park, these mountains, these cracks, and all that. Well, I don't know how long I was staring at the asphalt, but I was broken from my reverie by the sound of bum, 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 of a truck downshifting rapidly using its air brakes. I looked up, looked around, I saw a log truck bearing down on me and I couldn't tell how far away it was. I didn't know if I needed to hunker down and hope for the best, dash off the edge, or leisurely walk away. I didn't know what to do. Now we're gonna leave me on the asphalt <laughs> right there. Because I wanna talk about distance and how you measure distance. But we're gonna also leave US Highway 2 in Montana and use a different highway. The highway in the video that you saw at the beginning of this talk. This is US Highway 30. It is the original route of the Oregon Trail. You notice I did not die of dysentery making that video. So this is the satellite view of the route that I took in that video. I started in the lower left and went up to the top of Rowena Crest uh, in the, I'm sorry, I started in the lower right, up to the top uh, and the Rowena Crest in the upper left. We'll get the map and just look at the, the path itself. I want to figure out how long that highway was. And so I'm going to make a series of estimates to do it, and I'm going to use a measuring stick to do it, a ruler. And we're going to use a giant one to begin with. It's the crow's flight's distance from my origin to my destination. And rather than using kilometers or miles or something like that, I'm just going to call them units. So this is our baseline. This is one unit of distance. And as an uh, estimate of the length of that highway, it's a pretty rotten estimate. You can see I didn't go around any of the curves. It's just a straight line. So I really need to use a smaller ruler. Let's divide this ruler into four pieces, one quarter size. I'm going to define a couple variables here. We're going to call um, one quarter, we're going to call that epsilon. So the sub two is because this is our second estimate of that distance. And then we're going to count how many of these rulers it takes to follow the route of the highway. So we drop one down, 
The second one drops down, the third, the fourth. I've run out of the original rulers, but I've got more of them. So it takes six total rulers to cover the highway. And you can see it's a pretty rotten estimate, too. But the distance it comes up with can be thought of as a, an equation here. The original distance d1, which is 1, times epsilon sub 2 times n sub 2 is our distance sub 2. And that is 1 and a half. So we got a longer length of that highway. This is a good trend. Let's try cutting that thing into 8 pieces instead. So our epsilon sub 3 is going to be 1 eighth. We drop all of those down, and it ends up taking eight more of them to cover the path. So using this estimate, we get a distance of two for the highway. But again, it's not particularly good. You can look at that. I didn't even do the first loop there uh, at the beginning in the lower right. So continue on. Let's make this 1 16th instead. Now I can do that lower loop in the right, and it ends up taking uh, uh, a number of So it, the distance we measure is uh, 2 and 3 eighths for the distance. Well, take it down to 30, uh, 32nd for epsilon. The distance we come up with is 2 uh, and 15 30 seconds. Let's take all of these estimates and uh, put them on a chart. We notice that each time we used a smaller ruler, the highway got longer. So if we chart it like this, uh, our trial number, uh, on the x-axis and the distance we measure on the uh, y-axis, it looks like there's a trend here. Are we getting more and more accurate? Perhaps we are. As the ruler gets smaller, we get more and more accurate, right? We converge on the correct distance for the highway. What does your intuition tell you? And the progression in colors in that should give you a clue that I'm leading you into a trap. Let's look at a different uh, curve or different highway entirely. This is not really a highway. This is the Cook curve. Uh, it's a mathematical construct. And if I want to estimate its distance, we'll start with the same uh, initial one, uh, 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 D1. And we know we're going to have to cut it into thirds at least to uh, cover that highway, or that highway, that curve. Uh, and we find it's going to take four of them, four thirds to measure this. Well, you know, I'm over 50 now, and I have to use reading glasses. So I put on my reading glasses, and I see that, oh, the Cook curve isn't really that smooth. It's got these little dimples on it. And so I have to cut my, uh, my uh, ruler in by a third again to a ninth size. And it ends up taking uh, 16 of those. But I look again with a magnifying glass, and it's got even more little bumps on it. And so I have to, it's 4 thirds to the third power uh, to, for this, our third estimate. And that's a trend. So I can say, in general, that 4 thirds to the nth power will be the nth, the distance of the nth estimate we have. Well, what is, does that converge? This is the estimates we came up with for the distance of this. And if we chart those, and I charted them all, all the way out to 39th trial, that doesn't look like it's going to converge. In fact, it doesn't. We can prove mathematically as limit as n approaches infinity of 4 thirds to the n. That goes to infinity. Well, you know, the Cook curve, that's an artificial construct. It's a mathematical thing. It's got infinity built into the definition. Our universe doesn't have infinity in it in its definition, does it? There is nothing really in nature like this. And as just aside, this is called Romanesco broccoli. I can't think of anything that they missed an opportunity to really give this the proper name. This should be Fibonacci. <laughs> so anyway, in general, to come up with the distance estimate for something, it's going to be our distance estimate for any given trial is going to be some function f of n multiplied by epsilon sub n. So what is this f of n? Well, obviously, for the Cook curve, it is 4 to the nth power. But what is it for some arbitrary line? That's an arbitrary line. So for highway, US Highway 30, uh, the f of n is different for every n. It varies for the terrain. 
The geomorphology of the Columbia Gorge, it's about 60 miles uh, east of here, is the Columbia Plateau basalt flows from millions of years ago that have been severely modified by the last ice age, uh, the catastrophic floods of the Lake Missoula floods. Uh, basalt erodes in a very distinct way. Very uh, stark, sharp cliffs and level plateaus. The way an engineer builds a highway in that type of terrain is very different than one would build a highway in, let's say, Kansas. Uh, you end up with a different profile of the highway. So f of n for that kind of highway in that kind of terrain is going to be different from than one from Kansas. But as we get smaller and smaller, even the type of asphalt that we use is going to affect that f of n. What size is the gravel in the asphalt? What kind of sand did they use in that asphalt? Have you ever looked closely at asphalt? I have. <laughs> There's entire landscapes down there. Uh, imagine a tiny insect uh, going across that path. What route is he going to take? He'll have to take a route that is useful for him. He can't just go straight across because he's got valleys and mountain ranges to go through. On my motorcycle, I did not follow this same path. Or did I? If you think about how the motorcycle tire hit the asphalt, there were probably little protruding parts, and one part of the tire hit that first, and then maybe something a little back and off to the right. And I'm willing to bet it ends up being a, a very jagged line as kind of a, a forward-moving wave. So how far did I really ride? Is US 30 in Oregon infinitely long? Uh, how come uh, when you came here to Portland, you didn't see signs, Portland infinitely ahead? <laughs> um, it's because we stop measuring at a uh, range that is uh, in our uh, domain, where what's relevant to us. We don't have to go measure around every little atom in, the, in this thing. So it all depends on the length of our measuring stick. We stop at a, at a reasonable rate, uh, like the size of a car. If you measure that highway with the size of an 18-wheel truck versus the size of my motorcycle, you'd probably get different answers. Now, I want you to consider for a moment agile software development. You start by making a first cut of your software. You use a measuring stick that is quite long. And your soft end up the software you get isn't a very good estimate as to what you're going to eventually deliver. And then you, you essentially get a smaller stick and start adding details to that design. Does Agile converge? Is it an infinite process? Or do you end up stopping at some point when it is good enough in the same way that we measure distance? So think about that for a minute. Meanwhile, back in Montana, as you can see that I'm here today, it turns out that truck was well had enough uh, distance to come to a complete stop. The trucker got out, helped me ride the bike on the side of the highway, made sure I was OK, and I was so embarrassed, I just said, please, just go on, just go on. I'm, this is embarrassing. Uh, but I got back on that bike, started again, and proceeded down the highway. I found that as I went through these curves on the highway, that I could turn to the right just fine. It was fun. You just kind of lean to the right, and the bike swings around the curves. But to the left, that's what I did when I crashed. All of a sudden, it was frightening to turn to the left. I was slowing down a lot, much to the consternation of the people behind me. Uh, and to this day, and in fact, if you look at that video again, you'll find every time I go around a curve to the left, I do it much more slowly than I do going around curves to the right. And I got to tell you, if you're learning to ride a motorcycle, Glacier National Park isn't your best choice. <laughs> uh, I suppose you could say, if you do crash, I guess there will be grizzly bears to clean up the mess. So I made it on to work that day. I got suddenly lost what track slide I'm on. Yes. Uh, I made it on to work that day and started to give a lecture. Now we're going to talk about complexity. 
And this is the part of the lecture that I wrote last night, and so I'm going to have some surprise slides here. <laughs> so what is complexity? Can you define what complexity is? Most people, I've been talking with a lot of people uh, in the last two days about what complexity is, and the only thing in common I've seen is they know it when they see it. There are as many measures of complexity as there are fields of study. The economists have their measures. The botanists have theirs. Information theorists, programmers, you all know what big O notation is. It's a measure of complexity. I'm not going to iterate through all of these different measures here. There are just too many to talk about. But what is complexity? It is always too much of something. Too, many, too much indirection, too many connections, too many variables, too many parameters. But I'm willing to bet there is a law of some sort in this. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe someday we'll call it Lon's Law of Conservation of Complexity. But I'm willing to bet that in software, when you write something and you want to simplify, all you're doing is delegating complexity to somebody else. Because I don't think you can really get rid of complexity. If what you're attempting to model is more complex than the software that you wrote, then likely your, your model is incorrect. Because your software inevitably will be more complicated than the thing that you were trying to model. If, you're, if it's exactly the same plus some overhead for whatever the language does. This, in the world of uh, flowers, is called a Shirley poppy. Uh, it, the bio biologists or botanists will say it has a certain level of complexity. But if you look at closely at this, this is not a photograph. This is a drawing that I made about a month ago, made from one single line. Uh, it, the line branches. In other words, it's a maze. There's the solution to the maze. Since it is just one line, and there is exactly one path through it, it is isomorphic to a binary tree. Are binary trees complicated to you? Do you find a binary tree complicated? Someone say yes or no. Someone says yes. Well, I don't think they're very complicated. And in fact, if you go and do cyclomatic complexity on a binary tree, there are no cycles in there. It's not complicated. But if you take a different measure of complexity, one that takes into account not just the nodes of the binary tree, but the shape of the path between the nodes, like fractal dimension, this is very complex. It's the fractal dimension about 1.95, which is very complicated. So how do you express the curviness of a line? Now, I'm a biker, and you know it's all about the curves. Uh, and, you know, paddlers, the people who do kayaks, they have ways of, of uh, judging rivers. Class 5, class 6 kills you or something like that. But bikers, we don't have a way of saying what a highway is, how curvy it is. So I'm going to use fractal dimension. So this is a line. It fits what you learned in high school geometry about what a line is. It's one-dimensional. It's straight. But, you know, we also call this a line, even though it is clearly a two-dimensional object. We've kind of expanded this idea about what a line is in our colloquial world. <coughs> so fractal dimension is a quantity that can be best thought of as how fervently a line is trying to be a plane. And if you look at this, cur this, this curved line and start zooming in on it, you can see that it really isn't a very straight line. or not. It has a, a, a much more complexity as you zoom in. So fractal dimension is a ratio in the change in detail to the change in scale. For the Cook curve, it's the log of n over the log of epsilon, or the negative of that. So capital D is fractal dimension. So log of 4 over the log of 1 third, the negative, gives a fractal dimension of 1.26. In terms of a line trying to be a plane, the Cook curve isn't trying very hard. But there's no simple formula to come up with the fractal dimension of real-world phenomenon. But there is an algorithm. It's called the box-covering algorithm, and it works like this. 
You take your line and you cover it with a grid of boxes of known size. And you count how many boxes the line touches. And note the two numbers. In this case, 46. Then I take a different box size. Here I've cut them in half, now 50 pixels in size, and count those numbers, 106. Box size 25 gives me 247. And box size 10 gives me 863. If you plot those points as if we had an n and an epsilon, the slope of the line is fractal dimension. Now, I don't know if you guys in college or thing would, would try and plot things on a graph. When I plotted this the first time, I expected to see some curved line or something. But I was shocked to find a perfectly straight line that I could easily make fractal or get the slope of to get fractal dimension. So US Highway 30 at the Rowena Curves on the Oregon Trail has a fractal dimension of 1.28, a little bit curvier than the uh, Cook Curve. Back to Montana. I was decided that the topic of my lecture that day was going to be sorting. And this was the early 80s on Apple II computers in the language basic, and the sorting al algorithm of the day was the bubble sort. We had talked about loops in the previous lecture, and they seemed to have a good understanding of loops. But the moment we put one loop inside another loop, my students went blank. I tried different analogies, like the odometer on the car. The inner loop is the tenths, and the outer loop is the uh, single miles. It didn't help. They still didn't seem to understand. And I got frustrated with their not understanding, because it was, seemed so simple to me. But it was complex to them. Sometimes, complexity is in the eye of the beholder. One of my students raised his hand and said, you know, that's not the way I sort things at work. And I said, OK, how do you sort things at work? And then he blew me away by giving me the most succinct and clear definition of the recursive partition sort, quick sort, that I've ever heard in my life. And in fact, I can teach anyone the recursive partition sort using his explanation in under 60 seconds. How many of you, when you first encountered quicksort, found it to be complicated and hard to understand? I sure did. Let me clear it up for you. Let's say we have a bunch of things we're going to sort, and they're sitting on a table. We just guess which one's going to be in the middle, push it to the back of the table. Then we take our what's left, spread them out into two piles, move things that are less to one side, move things that are greater to the other side. That leaves with two piles that are on opposite sides of the, the one in the back. Repeat and with the other, those two piles and continue to repeat until you don't have any piles left. There. Why is that so simple compared to how we learned recursive part, the, the quicksort? It's because of the language that we learned quicksort in. Quicksort is always taught, it seems, in my view, in the C language. That's the letter C transcriptionist. So the C language uh, doesn't have data structures uh, that are, uh, they have arrays. And you have to deal with array indices. With quicksort, that obfuscates the algorithm entirely, dealing with this swapping idea of the, of the data. But that's really irrelevant to the algorithm. The algorithm is a beautifully recursive system. And we don't understand it because we couched the terms in a language that made it more complicated than it had to be. I was so impressed with this student, I, well, I was just totally blown away, I went to my backpack, I pulled out the book, Gertel Escher Bach, and I gave it to him and said, I really want to hear what you he think of chapter five. He looked a little taken aback at this, uh, but no, I went on with my lecture and the day ended and I rode, my motorcy er, rode the motorcycle home. It wasn't my motorcycle yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fractal dimension can be used to analyze 
the complexity of anything that can be plotted or projected into n dimensions. It's really easy to do it uh, uh, on the computer, especially in Python. Uh, this is the fractal dimension of the music I played in the opening video. I took uh, Python. I l uh, recorded my playing of the piece into a MIDI file. I then took Python, loaded the, the Mido uh, MIDI library, which loaded the file. I extracted the pitch out of every note that I played. Then I uh, took the Python image library, plotted it on a graph, and then took a algorithm for the box covering uh, algorithm that I found online and came up with fractal dimension. So the change in pitch in this particular piece of music was 6.29, quite well on the way to being complicated and, and uh, um, into the second dimension. So I have a demo here. I'm going to play another piece of music. And that didn't advance to where it was supposed to go, of course. And so I will try and guess. Please, please work. That's better. All right. Now this time, instead of a bassoon, I'm going to be a flute. Now, uh, I am going to take this piece of music, this Vivaldi work, and I'm going to tear it apart before your eyes. I'm going to show you the different sections in this piece of music and how each one builds on the complexity uh, by in different sections. In fact, let's just play it and let you judge for yourselves. This may be a different way than you've ever seen music before.
Now, that, thank you. That was a really terrible note to leave you hanging on. The next movement would have resolved that, and I have to fix it for you, otherwise you'll be hanging on the edge of a cliff. There, now it's, now it's more at the end. All right, let's answer some questions that came up in the middle of that. So this is the, the entire piece of music, has a fractal dimension of 1.6. That's really quite complex by fractal dimension standards. And the first section, A, is about 140 notes long with a fractal dimension of 1.5. But in the next section, section B, we made it more complicated by putting two notes between every note uh, every beat, instead of just one, like section one. But the fractal dimension went down to 1.2. Do you know why? Because it happened, the composer put those extra two notes in, in line with the trend of the notes on the beat. And so rather than making it more jagged and complicated, he smoothed it. Look at that, tr that graph right there compared to that one. That one is much smoother. So the fractal dimension went down. So isolation of a single dimension of multidimensional data can be deceptive. It can lead to unexpected results. Am I detecting patterns in my data? Or am I detecting artifacts from my rendition of the data? So if I had, if you think of musical notes as having a pitch a duration, a volume level, a change in volume. It's a tuple of a whole bunch of different values. And I isolated just pitch and nothing more. If I had used one of the other values or perhaps projected them all out of n-dimensional space into uh, a two-dimensional uh, object or two-dimensional chart, it would have come up with very different answers. Now, I've used fractal dimension in my work at Mozilla. I do the Firefox crash reporting system. And I found that, you know, how do you uh, do fractal dimension on a program? When Firefox crashes, it sends us a stack trace. What is a stack? It is a list of offsets into memory. That can be plotted on a chart. And I found that as a categorization system, it does some amazing things. I found that you can find two cr sets, two independent sets of crashes that appear to be different, but have very similar fractal dimension. And if you put them together and then look at the source code, the problems came from the same location, even though they appeared to be s completely distinct. But of course, there's also a, cou a counterexample. Fractal dimension is a very interesting system. Let's go back to Montana. I, uh, next time I went to my class, uh, the uh, student had been badly beaten. He had two black eyes, missing a front tooth, and his arm was in a sling. I was disturbed by this, and, uh, and when class ended, I asked him what happened. And he wouldn't look at me, and he didn't answer. So, he never showed up for class again. And uh, I, I, by the rules of the college, I had no choice but to fail him. And I felt really bad about that, and I didn't know what the story was, what had happened. Well, about six months passed at the end of the semester, and my landlady Gladys came over and uh, gave me her son's motorcycle. Said, here, sign this. It was the title. She was mad at her son. She, I said, I can't take your son's bike. And he, she said, it's in my name. It's my bike. <laughs> and then another day passed, and she came over, and she was mad at me. And she had my Gertel Escher Bach book. And she gave it to me and said, I don't know what you people are doing over at that school, because these people don't want it, and they don't need it. I suddenly realized the book and the student having been beaten were related. I gave him that book in front of his peers, 
And it wasn't just any book. It was a book about three European white men having done great things that I suppose people found on the reservation to be irrelevant to them. I was devastated. I quit my job teaching. And then I spent the next two years living in the area, almost literally wandering the wilderness, thinking about the damage that I had done to that man. And I felt really, really bad. So fast forward 17 years. I kept that book. I had loaned it to several people in that uh, time range. And I finally decided I need to finish reading it myself. And so I started reading the book. And I was annoyed that people had written in it. There uh, were words written. And you know, there's a lot of patterns in this book, games of playing with doing word patterns to, to explore recursion and things like that. And I just assumed, well, look, someone has, has done these games. And so I went and finished the book. I found it amazing, and it just really affirmed my life view. Fast forward another 17 years, and I'm writing this lecture for Pi Tennessee. And I'm looking at these words again, and I realize, wait a minute. This, this isn't even a chapter about word pa or letter patterns. What are these? And then I noticed those last three letters of that first word, T-S-I. And I remember a movie from the 1980s called Koyanaskatsi, a word from, apparently from the Hopi language. And we're in the 21st century. You know, you can find a Blackfeet English dictionary online. Now, I need to be clear about this. Uh, the words that I found in the book were not exactly the words that I found in the dictionary. And I've only shown, shown you here the words from the dictionary. Uh, I had to phonetically find the words in the dictionary because the, what was written was not exactly correct. So in a chapter about Bach, I found this word, or a similar word. It means Western meadowlark. The Western meadowlark has a really distinct call. I used to be able to whistle it. I'll try here. <whistles> Two notes, up a fifth. It is exactly what was talked about in the Bach section of the book. Then I found this word in a, in a section about recursion. This is the word for cloud. And then the words that I initially found near the end of the book was this. And on reading it, or translating it, I was stunned. It was a message from 30 years ago. Man having beard, his braids, too. I am grateful. Was I absolved? I don't know. But I was moved. And just as he was grateful for the opportunity to read this book, I am very grateful for having this honor to speak before all of you. Because it truly is an honor, and I found it totally unexpected. So I want to close with just a question for all of you. If you think about the path that your life has taken or is taking, what is the fractal dimension of your life? And how many left turns have you made? Thank you very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, come on, you're going to make me tear up now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Someone pull me off stage. <laughs>